From another anime swordsman to the main events of a direct, the Xenoblade series has been on a roll lately. When it comes to JRPG exclusives, Nintendo knows that they have something special on their hands. And so should you. I adore all three of the Xenoblade games, which is an opinion that is less common than you think. So, I wanted to talk about the background of each entry, their strengths and weaknesses, why they're not all universally loved, and more importantly, why they all should be. Showtime. The original Xenoblade released in 2010. There was already excitement due to its ties to the Xenosaga series as well as the cult classic Xenogears. That excitement was more than validated when people finally played it. It garnered critical acclaim with some even calling it the best JRPG of the generation. But not everyone got to play it right away. Though it received a UK localization in 2011, Nintendo of America wouldn't budge. Because of this, fans organized a campaign named Operation Rainfall, aiming to bring The Last Story, Pandora's Tower, and Xenoblade over to the West. And while its exact influence is debatable, its success is undeniable. So how exactly did Xenoblade satisfy that hell of a buildup? Well, if you've ever seen anybody praise this game, the first and most likely only aspect they referred to was the story. Xenoblade stars a young adult named Shulk, who dedicates his life studying a mythical sword known as the Monado. One day, his town, Colony 9, is viciously invaded by mechanical beings called Mechon. Thanks to the Monado's power, Shulk is able to fight them off while having sudden visions of the future. Shulk then ventures off to not only solve the mystery of the Monado, but to get revenge. Now I could go into so much more, but you deserve to find out yourself. See, Xenoblade is developed by Monolith Soft, who you'll get to know as the master of two crafts. The first is storytelling. There is a plethora of clever foreshadowing, great writing, and memorable plot twists. The story of Xenoblade deserves all the praise it gets. It is an emotional roller coaster that is guaranteed to leave a long-lasting impression. However, there's another reason why this series is special. Monolith Soft is also a master of world building and art direction. If you've ever wondered how Breath of the Wild has such an amazing overworld, it's because Monolith was there to help. Hell, they've been good at this since Bat and Kaidos, which I'd also love to see a remaster of, by the way. Let's start with how Xenoblade's world even came to be. Two titans, the Bionis and Mechonis respectively, battled each other until they both died. And over time, their still standing, lifeless bodies became home to a variety of life. It sounds silly now that I think about it, but it's so unique and just badass. It also gives a magnificent sense of scale. You can often see other body parts in the distance, reminding you of how far you traveled and how much more there is to see. Premise aside, the environments inspire exploration by simply existing. Seriously, open world or not, the world design in the Xenoblade series is among the greatest you'll ever experience. The best part is, you're constantly rewarded for exploring. There is an abundance of collectibles to find, unique monsters to fight, and areas you would never come close to finding if you just followed the story, but if you do find them, you get EXP! Some enemies on the field will be aggressive, and that's where the battle system comes in. Arts are the main mechanic of battling, with effects ranging from healing to dealing extra damage if positioned correctly. Each party member has their own collection of arts, but once they're used, they'll go into a cooldown so they can't be spammed. Fear not though, your character will still auto-attack when within range. Each member also has their own talent art, which usually has to be charged up by auto-attacking. For example, Shulk's talent art lets him use one of the Monado's many powers. On the top left of the screen is the party gauge, which can be filled through various means, such as timing occasional B prompts correctly. One segment of the gauge can be used to revive an ally, but using the entire gauge results in a chain attack, where your party can spam arts on the enemy. I don't plan on explaining the nitty gritty, but what I can't avoid is the mechanic that defined the game. Visions. Shulk will often have visions of an attack that will incapacitate or at least do a lot of damage to an ally. To change the future, Shulk can use his talent art or advise an ally to use one of their arts in retaliation. <sighs> Alright guys, we had our fun. I told you I'm discussing both strengths and weaknesses. The community will make you believe there are no weaknesses, but sometimes the hardest part about being a Xenoblade fan is being surrounded by other Xenoblade fans. 
Imagine you're at home with the friends, mentioning any resemblance of positivity for X or 2. Then, right after that happens, someone knocks on your door to tell you about how 1 is a masterpiece, and how the story is so good, and how you'll love it way more than the game you're talking about. There are other reasons I'll get to later, but the point is, Xenoblade 1 deserves a much-needed Devil's Advocate. There aren't major flaws, but since there's a remaster that will presumably be better, there are aspects worth addressing. Going back to Visions, they can make a battle thrilling, but at some point I realized they're a dramatic version of backseat gaming. They interrupt the action for a few seconds just to tell you what you should do if you don't want to lose. Nonetheless, there are situations where you almost have to play as a specific character to win, meaning the party member AI is so bad you have to do it yourself. Shulk and Melia in particular have pretty bad AI and they're both crucial for defeating certain enemies. Especially Melia. <laughs> oh god. You can expect the JRPG to have a bunch of side quests, but Xenoblade goes one step further by having side quests resembling an MMO in terms of quantity and depth. That compliment doesn't hold much water for now, because Xenoblade 1 side quests are generally not interesting. I played X and 2 for hundreds of hours, so it says a lot that, at the height of my free time and my love for this game, I stopped right after I beat it, which I guess isn't a big deal because the story's so good. Speaking of which, there are many elements to the narrative, and some are notably weaker than others. The important part, the part that is raved about, involves Shulk, Fiora, Melia, and Dunman. The romance between Shulk and Fiora is the highlight for me. Then there's Ryan, Sharla, and Ricky. I honestly cannot remember a single significant contribution of Ricky, so there goes that. Besides his meme voice lines... Now it's Ryan time! Ryan time, baby! Can't have a rainbow without Ryan, baby! Ryan doesn't get much other than a kind of sort of romance with Sharla. Whatever it is, it didn't work. It feels like this dynamic existed because the writers couldn't think of anything else. Sharla got the short end of the stick because her brother's annoying and her fiancé's disappearance is a long-running plot thread just for it to end predictably and underwhelmingly. In a similar fashion, there's a character named Alvis whose role in the whole grand scheme of things is an even longer-running plot thread with an end that is unpredictable in a bad way. It's not so bad in hindsight, but in the moment it's like, okay... That happens, moving on. Again, nothing huge and you may not agree, but that conversation is worth way more than the common Xenoblade 1 is a masterpiece and the story is so good. Hey, did you guys know that the story in Xenoblade 1 is so good and it's the best Xenoblade ever because the story is so good? It's fitting how emphasized that is because the gameplay is certainly the first of its kind. Still great, the others just have more to offer, starting with Xenoblade X. Xenoblade X was released in 2015 and is one of the most highly requested ports for Switch, and while it seemingly has been shot down, the demand is as strong as ever. But it wasn't always this way. It's hilarious that we even got to this point. I always use Majora's Mask and Wind Waker as examples of don't bandwagon opinions of a fanbase, and believe it or not, X is a good example. People hated this game! Fans were expecting Xenoblade 1, but open world, and X was never going to be that. It was always meant to have its own identity driven by gameplay, not story. I wasn't bothered at all with the change in direction because the developers were transparent about it. I don't expect everyone to follow interviews, of course, so the negative reaction was inevitable. Not to mention, there was an uproar over localization censorship, like how the 13-year-old wasn't allowed to show as much skin and how the bus size slider was removed altogether. Keep that in mind for later. Oh, there's a huge change right off the bat. Instead of a set main protagonist, you can create your own character. Okay, Elma is still the true protagonist, but a custom character works for the way the game unfolds. The story revolves around the human race being stuck on a whole different planet. Am I wrong? That's it! There are a few awesome twists, but otherwise it's straightforward. Unironically, the more important matter is that song I just sang. It cannot be clearer as to why X is not a numbered entry. It's more sci-fi than fantasy, it has American accents as opposed to European, and the music is a complete departure. 1 and 2 have universally praised soundtracks composed by a similar group of talents. 
X, on the other hand, went for the divisive choice of having the entire soundtrack composed by Hiroyuki Samano, well known for his work on Attack on Titan and Kill a Kill. I personally love the soundtrack, yeah, a few of the tracks are corny as hell, which is appealing in its own way, but most of them are great and perfectly fit the game's aesthetic. If anything, X has the best theme for a staple of the series, Unique Monsters. These monsters are like boss battles lying around the overworld, and on a side note, their names are amazing. They can go from magnificence, like Sylvester the Morning Light, to downright comical, like Casper the Unhealthy Eater, Sheldon the Dentally Challenged, and Camille the Immortal, who's level 19 by the way. Don't get me wrong, X may be misunderstood, but it does have one major flaw. It takes a while for X to become good. The mechanics are so complex that it'll take a while to understand. The game takes a while to teach everything, poorly might I add. And lastly, it takes a while to unlock the mech, which is one of the best features of any video game. I really can't blame anyone for disliking X for this reason. If you want to enjoy X, you need to already know you'll enjoy X, and you need to be committed. I promise you though, meet those conditions, and you're in for an outstanding experience. X is the sole entry that is truly open world, so you can bet Monolith went far and beyond in making that world as fascinating as can be. X takes place in Mira, an alien planet with five themed continents. Five may not seem that much, but each of them is gigantic and full of seemingly endless secrets. It's hard to express without the finer details, but the mechanics are so interwoven with exploration that you'll never feel like you're wasting time. It'll take a while, but you'll eventually realize, wow, I just wandered aimlessly for fun and all of that actually benefited me. While the main story is underwhelming, there are flashes of brilliant storytelling in the side quests, which is a tremendous upgrade. There is so much character development and world building you would otherwise never see. The biggest evidence for this is affinity missions, which revolve around party members, being you, Alma, and Lin. There's also Tatsu, who doesn't battle at all, but he's always around. Napons are the signature creature of the Xenoblade series, so much like Ricky, the adventurer has to have a token Napon. Anyway, the cast may seem small, but there's at least a dozen other characters you can swap into your party as you please. These optional characters have their own affinity missions, so there's a lot to do. Some quests are surprisingly dark and can even kill off NPCs, while others allow the characters to shine through banter without the need of a strong narrative. Perhaps the trait that is most similar to one is the combat. Each party member can switch between a melee weapon and a ranged weapon, meaning they'll have two sets of arts to use. Arts cool down like before, but if you keep auto-attacking, they can go through another cooldown, making them much more impactful. The party gauge no longer exists, so chain attacks are gone and reviving an ally requires a new mechanic. Tension Points, or TP. TP is also accumulated by auto-attacking, and once at 3000, you can either revive an ally or use the replacement for talent arts. Overdrive. For an influenceable period, all of your arts take significantly less time to cool down, and can cool down for a third time for super damage. There are tons to learn about, but even at this basic level, Overdrive is so satisfying. Each party member has a set of another new mechanic, Soul Voices. By meeting a unique condition, either your character will tell someone to use an art of the same color, or someone will tell you. Sort of like Visions, except the reward for doing so will be a certain buff to your party. While it isn't as urgent as, hey, do this or you're gonna die, I like that. I like that it can win or lose you a battle, but it's subtle enough that the combat will keep moving smoothly. The combat is... just... better. I didn't even touch on mech battles, but I'm sure you can tell those are fun too. Overall, playing the game? is just better. From purely a gameplay perspective, X improves on almost every aspect. This is why it's difficult for me to revisit the original Xenoblade. I already know the story, so when I'm playing it, I just wish I was playing this game instead. Needless to say, Xenoblade X succeeded on its focus on gameplay, if you have the patience. It really does deserve its own port and sequel. Come on, Monolith. You can't end it like that. Regardless, I'm hoping you can now see the differences between the numbered entries and X. And given that the next game is 2 and not X, it should be story driven, which means everyone's happy, right? I hate you guys.
Xenoblade 2 was revealed during the Nintendo Switch presentation in January 2017, and then was released later that same year in December. What an incredible year. With how short of a notice it was, there wasn't that much to go off of, except for a single very controversial detail. Anime. Fans were upset about how anime it clearly was, and to be fair, Xenoblade 2 is indeed the most anime of the three. Even to this day. Two years later, whenever I see somebody bash this game, 90% of the time, their argument can be summed up with, I don't like anime. Hey, did you guys know that Xenoblade 1's story is so good? It's so baffling because you're full of shit. And here's why. A common complaint, particularly before the game released, is that the art style is generic 3D anime. Which I don't disagree with, but are you seriously telling me you'd rather have this? And lo and behold, everyone loves how the remaster looks, even though it's pretty damn close to what they complained about. But the worst part is, people see this art style and just assume the worst, because it's anime. To a lesser extent, the same could be happening to the remaster. I didn't think I'd have to say this in a video, but you shouldn't look at someone or something and assume all the bad stereotypes apply. Some will claim that the story and characters are not so good because they're full of anime tropes. Really? I'm not denying there's tropes, but Xenoblade 2 is no more anime than Fire Emblem Three Houses and Persona 5. Those games are terrible, right? And between those three, Xenoblade 2 easily has the best story, so this whole accusation is nonsense. But Nara, I have the right to be upset when a series I love goes through a completely out of left field change. And? I agree. The problem is, it wasn't that left field. Have you played Xenoblade X? Probably not, because that game is anime as hell. Maybe that's why we should get a port. Now if you just compare 1 and 2, there is an escalation. But don't act like 1 wasn't anime, especially when it comes to the most popular complaints. Fan service. First off, you don't have to look too hard to find skin in mainstream video games, films, and other forms of media. I find it strange that no one minds all that, but as soon as someone draws cleavage on an anime character, it's too much. Fan service is too much if it actively distracts from the substance of the material. And nope, doesn't apply here. There is one optional character that's weird, but in terms of those who are actually relevant, the closest would be Pyra because her boobs are big and the lower half of her outfits is silly. But if that's crossing the line, that says more about you. More importantly, fan service in a Xenoblade game is nowhere near new. Remember the outrage when the bus slider was removed? Remember when X had a cutscene dedicated to alien ass? Remember when unlike Xenoblade 2 you could dress up your party members in whatever armor you wanted? Remember when unlike Xenoblade 2 you could just take their clothes off? Remember how fans were outraged that the 13 year old didn't show as much skin anymore? Remember all the cleavage in Xenoblade 1 but nobody remembers because the graphics didn't age well? Ah, you'll remember soon. Besides, you can go way back to Xenosaga. Monolith Soft's 20th anniversary was recent, and despite the success of Xenoblade, guess who's front and center of the celebratory artwork? Cosmos. Now, if you were to do any research on their mascots of many years, you'd know that I'm right. Cosmos. Pointing your fingers at 2 is being in denial of the series and ignorance of the entire Xeno franchise. And if you just don't like anime and fan service and whatnot, more power to you. But your tastes are not indicative of quality. Just be more honest with yourself and say, hey, it's not for me. And that's okay. No need to exaggerate, no need to look down on others, no need to bash the game for being different and then beg for a port years later. <laughs> Let's finally move on. I've already done a video on Xenoblade 2, so I'll merely focus on what makes it stand out. Xenoblade 2 stars Rex, a young salvager who's hired to find the legendary Aegis, Pyra. In the world of Aorest, humans command powerful life forms called Blades, with the Aegis being the most powerful of all. Once Rex succeeds though, he is stabbed in the back by his patrons and left to die. Before he fades away, Pyra manages to contact him for a deal. She will revive him using half of her life force, but in return, Rex has to bring her to the Promised Land, Elysium. 
And now that Monolith is trying this time, this coming of age adventure will be more complicated and emotional than he bargained for. It may not be as long, ambitious, and shocking as one's, but it resonated with me more for two reasons. To me, blades are the most intriguing concept in the series. For instance, a blade's master is called a driver, and when the driver dies, the blade will lose consciousness until it is summoned again and will lose all of its memory permanently. By itself, the memory loss is a profound issue to tackle, but then it leads to more depressing and darker consequences than I ever imagined. This coincides with my other reason. Out of each entry, Xenoblade 2 has the best cast of characters and my favorite JRPG party ever. There are two weak links, being Tora, the token Napon, so it's not that surprising, and unfortunately Rex, being the cliché, optimistic yet naive protagonist. Rex isn't necessarily a bad hero, he's just underwhelming compared to Shulk. They may be weak alone, but that doesn't matter because the group as a whole has an insane amount of charm and chemistry. They feel like natural friends instead of individuals with a common goal. Personalities aside, 2 simply does the best with character development and making each member have significant contributions to the narrative. Even Tora's backstory has major repercussions, and he's the Napon! By the way, I'm not hating on Napons, they're cute chonky creatures with questionable morals, and I think that's hilarious. I like the cast of One, but for the most part, we care because of what happens to them. The story makes those characters, while these characters make the story. Shulk's party may have a more impressive journey, but I'd rather be on a journey with Rex's party. This does mean the adventure is often lighthearted, especially in the first half, but it isn't at the expense of any deeper emotion you'll end up feeling for everyone, even the villains. In terms of gameplay, this is where Xenoblade 2 truly stands out. The battle system is, at least initially, a bit slower paced. You have to stand still in order to auto attack, which may seem unnecessary, but it's understandable considering auto attacks directly charge arts. Arts then charge specials all the way up to level 4, allowing you to pull off combos, the main mechanic of combat. There are three steps to a combo. The first step requires a level 1 or higher, the second requires a level 2 or higher, and you get it. There's limited time to pull off each step, but don't panic, it's not solely up to you. Your teammates will signify when they can continue the combo. Furthermore, not only do you need the appropriate level of special, you need the appropriate elements according to the combo tree. The element is based off the blade you're using. Yep, blades aren't just a type of character, they affect the gameplay in all facets. Your party consists of drivers, who can switch between three blades with their own movesets, similar to switching weapons in X. Blades themselves support from the sidelines, and their effectiveness is strengthened by staying nearby. That was as basic as I could get, and it's a lot regardless, so if you're still confused, refer to my more thorough video. On the bright side, there is some familiarity with the party gauge and chain attacks returning, even if they're not exactly the same. The battle system may seem confusing, but it'll become an absolute delight to constantly pull off combos, chain attack, and put the pieces all together. I recommend focusing on Chapter 3, where the story and mechanics pick up, but it's easier said than done when the exploration is as tempting as ever. Our rest is a mix of previous ideas, there are several titans to live on, and each one has a theme. This time, there are occasional pathways and actions that require a certain level of your blade's field skills. The condition to level up field skills can be found on a blade's affinity chart, and as long as you keep them in mind, they shouldn't be an issue. Affinity charts can be addictive anyway. I get an upgrade and fill this hole? Oh yes! Affinity missions return in the form of blade quests, and the quality of side quests in general is up to par as well. Wow, these blades sound awesome! How do I get more, Nara? Uh... Blades are summoned with core crystals, but the one you receive is up to luck. Most blades are generic, but the rare ones are actual characters with their own quests and more potential. It's practically a gotcha mechanic without paying any money. I know the word gotcha is upsetting, but it's only annoying if you want to get all the rare blades or a very specific one. Anybody who played the game, you know which one. Besides, you get a good number of rare blades through the story and side quests. Even if you were to ignore the gacha completely, you'd still have a fulfilling experience. What you can't ignore is Xenoblade 2's biggest flaw. There's a couple of minor yet nagging inconveniences. It was a lot worse when it released, but there's been great patches since. Except for one. Don't forget me! 
You're done? Still, they could have done a bit more. For example, field skill requirements can only be met with the blades currently equipped. That makes sense, but swapping each blade for this gets tedious. We should be able to save our favorite blade setups, so it's like swapping playlists. Or better yet, just automatically detect which three blades of each driver has the highest level of that field skill. Not a deal breaker by any means, but it is surprising considering the improvements they made in Torna. Oh, I, I should mention, there's an expansion pass! The main attraction for the base game is a Colosseum mode where previous protagonists act as blades, but more importantly, you can get extra costumes like swimsuits, baby! Now, if you were thinking that people wouldn't complain about this because you can be half-naked in Xenoblade 1 and Smash, you'd be wrong. The main attraction overall is a prequel adventure, Torna, the Golden Country. I won't go much into it now because it's very similar mechanically, but just know it is more than worth it. Allow me to state the obvious. I love Xenoblade 2, no matter how different it is. I adore how Monolith embrace Blades by incorporating them in so much of the gameplay. They feel like an actual driving force of the world rather than just a story element. There may have been more changes than some wanted, but this results in such a unique game with its own identity. I'd take X and 2 over just another Xenoblade any day. That's why I love the 3D Zelda games, you can immediately distinguish them because Nintendo wasn't afraid to change the art style or introduce unexpected mechanics. Sure, it may trigger a toxic elitist fanbase that only wants games like their favorite, but Nintendo doesn't regret their choices, and in hindsight, neither do the fans. Because of that, I'm glad Nintendo wasn't afraid. And I'm glad Monolith wasn't either. If the Xenoblade series ends up following a similar path, I'm in! I love these games! I want all of them to get recognition. But I do have a favorite, and what I believe to be the best. The average individual has the highest chance of preferring Xenoblade 1. Not because of the story, but because it's the most accessible. X and 2 have a larger learning curve, so they require more patience. There are also more anime, and we know how people feel about that. One did set a hell of a bar though. Maybe not in graphics, but I'm not gonna argue if it was called a masterpiece. However, I can't bring myself to call it the best when the gameplay of X and 2 are simply better. If it wasn't for the remaster, I might never touch Xenoblade 1 ever again, so it can't be my favorite. Meanwhile, I'd love to replay Xenoblade X. It's the pinnacle of how much fun I had with this series. The fact that it wasn't story-driven didn't hinder my enjoyment whatsoever. What it did hinder was the impact. I don't need an immersive story to enjoy a JRPG, but I would prefer one. Because of that, Xenoblade X was the kind of game I really enjoyed, but it doesn't cross my mind that much, at least when compared to the others. Then there's Xenoblade 2. The story isn't as incredible as 1, but it's right up there. The gameplay isn't as incredible as X, but it's right up there too. So... Okay, it's my favorite. It doesn't take much thought. It does the best job at being fun and addictive while telling a great story, so I think it's the best. Makes sense to me. Whatever your favorite is, don't be a dick about it. And if you've never played any, hopefully I help convince you to fix that? Either way, what a comeback story though, right? Xenoblade went from almost not being localized to being one of Nintendo's headlines. <sighs> that story is so good.